Hello there. It's currently maple syrup season, so in today's video I thought I'd show how to collect and process it. Syrup season is in the transition between winter and spring, when the trees are just starting to come out of hibernation, when the temperature is going above zero during the day and below zero during the night. This is when the sap runs best, when the trees are pumping the sap up from storage in the roots, then changing their mind and sending it back down. The first thing to do is to try and find a suitable tree. You want a sugar maple that's more than a foot thick. Other maples work, but not as well. In order to avoid stressing the tree unnecessarily, I don't tap a tree until the old wounds have healed up. You only need to tap about three trees to make a year's supply of syrup for a household. As I'm not selling the stuff, I can afford to rotate between trees. Having found some potential victims, we can begin drilling the holes. It's best to put the holes on the south side of the tree, as this side gets more sunlight and will warm up more throughout the day. Also, trees near the edge of the brush will tend to produce better than trees in the center. You want to drill the hole at a slight upward angle, just enough that the sap will be inclined to drip out. You don't want to drill the hole near any of the old scars, as the sap runs more slowly near the old wounds. Normally I would use an electric drill gun to make the holes. Just for fun I'm using a brace and bit today. Back in the day before steel drills, you would use a chisel or an axe to gouge the tree. I'm not going to be doing this, as this puts a bit more stress on the tree. I'd imagine you could also use a bow drill, but I haven't read anything to support that, and I'm not a skilled enough flint napper to try it out myself. For now, this is traditional enough for me. You can judge the depth of the hole by measuring the spile against the drill bit and making a little mark in pencil. Once we've got the hole drilled, then we can pound in the spile. I'm using modern plastic ones here, just for convenience sake. Traditional spiles were made by taking a branch and then boring out the spongy pith down the center, then shaping it like a spike. Others were simple wooden troughs that were inserted into the cuts. With the spile installed, we hang up the bucket, and then we're good to go. Not the best drip rate, but not too bad. I probably tapped the trees a little bit early. Oh well. Historically, the sap would be collected in birch bark buckets or in wooden troughs. I didn't do so this time because I'm a filthy casual. After a day or two of dripping, you should have enough sap to be worth boiling down. The raw sap is a really delicious yearly treat. Some people say it has health benefits. I don't know about that, but it tastes good. If I'm tapping a lot of trees, I'll collect the sap every day add it to a big pot on the stove that I've just got continually boiling down. Because I've only done a couple of trees this time, I'll leave it a couple of days before collecting. There's a minimum amount that is worth collecting. For example, the larger of these two buckets, when full, can be boiled down into a small jar of syrup. Careful not to spill it. It's a pot of liquid gold you got there, and the wet ground is slippery. Before you boil it, you've got to filter it. Get out all those leaves and bugs and wood chips. For a filter, I just use a piece of paper towel. It won't get it quite as clean as something like a coffee filter, but it will allow you to pour much more quickly. Back when I used a coffee filter, it would take 5-10 minutes to filter a whole bucket. Hard on the arms to pour for that long. The ice chunks have got much lower sugar content than the rest of the sap, so most people will just throw them outside. I'm stingy though, so I tend to melt them and add them back to the pot. Then we set the pot to boil and walk away for a couple of hours. So let's talk about some of the ways that sap was boiled down back in the day. Something that I've heard all over the place is that sap was boiled in large wooden troughs by heating stones and adding them to the sap. I've seen this done at various events, and having tried it myself, I can confirm that it does indeed work. You just have to make sure that you're using the right sort of stone. Something like limestone will shatter if you cool it too quickly. However, despite having tried this technique, I'm still skeptical of it. It's a lot of work moving the stones between the fire and the trough, as they cool off fast in the sap. And every time you put a rock back into the fire, you're putting a bit of sugar into that fire with it. Furthermore, you get a lot of ash in the sap, and then when you finish, most of the syrup is going to stick to the rocks and to the bottom of the wooden trough. 
I just don't see why you would do this when you could just use a cook pot. We had pottery, why would we not use it? With a pot, you don't have to worry about moving hot stones around. You don't have to worry about getting ash in your syrup. All you have to do is keep the fire going. And you have to do that anyway, because it's still bloody cold this time of year. The only reason I could think of that you might want to use a trough rather than a pot is that a pot is kind of limited in terms of volume. Where a trough can be made about the size of a canoe, this pot here is about as big as cook pots get. A counter-argument could be that you could just get more pots. In the modern day, that's what I'd do if I went overboard tapping and I got too much sap boiling. The counter-argument to that could be, well, maybe you just don't have enough pots. But you could counter that with, a village has to feed several hundred people, maybe thousands of people. Of course it's going to have a lot of cook pots. And you can keep arguing like that indefinitely. I've had two ideas on this subject. The first is that maybe troughs were used when making sugar rather than syrup. I don't imagine I'd notice much if there was a bit of ash in my sugar. I'd notice a lot if there was ash in my syrup. Also, it would be easier to scrape sugar off of the bottom of the trough and off of the rocks than it would be to scrape syrup off of the bottom of the trough. Another idea I had is that maybe the troughs were used during the initial stages of production. Rather than lugging back a load of what is mostly water, you could boil it down, say, halfway where you collected it, then lug it back and finish it off in the pots where it would be cleaner, easier to watch. But those are just ideas. The boiling sap makes for a very nice tea. Nice yearly treat. This was a fun experiment, but I didn't have any particular desire to finish things off outside, so I took it in and added it back to the main pot. As you can see, it's boiled down quite a bit, and it's turned sort of a yellowish-brown color. There's also a bit of foam appearing on the surface. It's still got a ways to go, so we'll check in on it again in a couple of hours. Here it's getting pretty close. I've transferred it to a smaller pot as it boiled down. More depth makes it less likely to burn. As you can see, there's a lot of foam now, but when I stir it, the foam mostly goes away. The syrup is very close now. You want to check on it every couple of minutes. It can burn really easily if you're not paying attention. Here I've moved the syrup onto a slower burner. Just looking at it, you can see how thick and close it is. But again, if I stir it, the foam will mostly go away. A few minutes later and we have lots of foam that I can't stir away. This is how you know that it's ready. So now you get your mason jar and pour it all in. Every little drop, can't let any go to waste. Then the lid goes on, you set it on the counter to cool off before you put it in the fridge. If you've got multiple half jars, or if a batch turned out a little bit thin, you can just add them to your next boiling. And that's all I have to say for today. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.